Today on Let's Talk, voiceover with BT and Randy Ryan. Brian has technical difficulties. Randy goes to Russia to talk wargaming. We explore approaches to directing voice actors. And we discuss acting for the screen versus acting for a video game. So let's talk. Voiceover. Let's talk. Let's talk. Let's talk. Let's talk. What we're trying to do is figure out how to record this podcast because. Randall and I are in two different cities. Yeah, we're in. We are. We're in two different states. We're in two different yeah. states of being. <laughs> I think people who know us have have always known that, so that's fine. <laughs> um, technology. God bless you. Yeah, I love you to death, and I hate you at the same time. Okay, so if I do that, I'm following these online tutorials. God, did I screw myself up with an online tutorial. <laughs> I'm visiting my folks two states away, right, over the weekend. And come Sunday afternoon, and it's time for me to go home, right? right. Mom cooked the meal because that's what she does. Right. <laughs> and so I ate a real heavy meal. I was exhausted and ready for a nice nap, but I knew I had to go home. So my my car, right, I go in, and I, I start it up, and it's, it's running. And all of a sudden, I look down, and I realize there's no – instrumentation. There's no Ooh. dash panel. And I've got a manual, right? So uh, I've got a stick shift. So not only do I not have a speedometer, I don't have a tachometer. I don't have a temperature gauge and I don't have a gas gauge. But the car's running. So it's not like, but the car's running. So it's not like, so like you're, it's not like your alternator's down and you're about to just die. Right. Right. So, you know, me being the logical troubleshooter, I'm going, okay, so if it's all working and just this isn't happening, it's probably a fuse. So I go in and I pop it and I look at all the fuses. The fuses all look good, but you can never really tell with a fuse, yeah, right? Yeah, they're pretty small. <laughs> so I go to the auto parts store and I pick up fuses and I come back and I pop it in. And I'm like, okay, good. No, not happening. Hmm. So <laughs> then I go ahead and, and, and I'm like, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to outsmart this thing. I'm going to pull every fuse and put them back in and just make sure there isn't a blown fuse somewhere else, right? That might have been affecting that didn't sync with whatever the fuse – diagram chart is right and so i do all that and then boy what do i do i turn to the internet because the internet's always right right and so i turn to the internet and there's someone that says start the car pull the b1 fuse then turn the car off and then put it back in and it'll do a, a reset on your instrumentation panel okay and i'm like right. Okay, great. Right. Sounds so I good. do that. Right. So I, so I start the car, I pull the fuse and all of a sudden the car starts to sound like it's not getting gas and it stops. Mm -hmm. So then I pop, I pop the fuse back in and I go to start it and bam, nothing. Oh no. It, it cranks, it cranks, it cranks, it cranks. It doesn't fire. There's no firing at all. And so now my car's effectively dead. <laughs> oh, no. So <laughs> what I end up doing is I have to wait because this is a, of course on a Sunday. On a Sunday, right. right. So I have to wait and then I have to call at eight o'clock Monday morning and find a shop that deals with German cars. Right. Right. Because you don't just take it to anybody because they'll really right. mess it up on you. So I have to find a shop that deals with German cars. Then I have to call AAA and pay $30 <laughs> to get towed over to the shop. And then the shop charges me $250 oh. to get it back to the working shape that it was. And what did they do? Well, they had to do – they found a blown fuse because evidently when I was messing with the fuses, I popped one back in and, you know, it was the fuel pump, uh -huh. which I kind of figured, but I had already messed it up so bad that I wasn't about to go there again, right, and continue to mess with it because I knew – and, of course, in a German car, anything you do is an automatic $250. Right, right. Merging on $1,500. Right. $3,500. Yes. So – I didn't want to continue to compound my issue. So it cost me $250 to get back to the stage I was in. I got the car back. And, and of course, you know, I've got stuff to do because it's now the week. Right. And, and so I have to get back to my house two states away. And so I end up downloading a speedometer app on my phone, <laughs> prop that up on the instrumentation panel. And did it work? And drive for six hours to get home based on an app. And it worked. It works seamlessly. It's, wow. it's, it's amazing, right? So, which is what I was thinking, what I should have done on Sunday, but I didn't think about it until after I kind of popped it and then it wouldn't start. And then I was like, oh, well, there you go, right? Mm -hmm. So, 
Uh, oh, it was an expensive weekend. All of a sudden, yeah. my phone my phone bricks on Friday night. I'm sitting there and, and I hear a little thing and it, then it clicks and then I go to check it and it's it's bricked. It's absolutely bricked. And it's only then that I go to the internet because, again, the internet's always right uh, <laughs> and find out that this is a known issue with my model of phone. Um, the heat oh. sinks don't work effectively and therefore uh, sooner or later your phone bricks and of course it happened while I was out of town oh. so I went and bought a new phone so it was a, a rather expensive weekend just to go they'll teach you to go visit your parents <laughs> <laughs> oh boy so how are you doing sir I'm I'm good I you know I was uh, I don't I don't even remember if we've talked about this or not but you know I went to Russia a couple of weeks ago to speak I have a, a lot of friends who over the, the last several years have gravitated to work for wargaming and they really and you went to Russia for wargaming they well they they started in I believe they started in Minsk and uh, in Belarus so uh, but they have offices oh, in Saint by, by the way by the way hello NSA we're here yeah right <laughs> yeah well I've 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 given up on that a long time ago <laughs> so um, but they have an office in Saint Petersburg too and so they've started this conference that was really. Um, I didn't know anything about, you know, my whole thing was I, I was asked if I wanted to come and speak there because they were trying to get more people from the West. It's a, it's a West meets East thing. And when I got there and I started talking to some of the people from Wargaming and, and found out a little bit more about this, the conference was really fascinating. And I'll get to the, the whole being in Russia part in a minute. Their concept, and it is not lip service, it does not, it certainly does not appear to be lip service, is they want to foster more collaboration and more openness, not only between people from what we would normally call the East versus the West, but just in the games industry in general. It's kind of the, the thing that you and I have talked about Austin before, about the, one sure. of the attractions of it was that the populace as a general rule is not about keeping, you know, protecting their slice of the pie. It's about growing the pie and, 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 sh and sharing. Yeah. And, and, right. And, yeah, and sharing, sharing secret your, sauce. Right. And not worrying, you know, like, oh, they're going to steal my thing. It's like, pff, yeah, no big deal. So that's really their purpose. So they wanted Westerners and they want to hold it in the Eastern Bloc because uh, my impression is that Westerners don't go to the East. The East already goes to the West. And so to demystify and to make sharing and collaboration more more of a two-way street, put the Westerners in the Eastern places like Russia, uh, Belarus, Ukraine, and Cyprus, and so on, so that you – you put them in the position of being the guest as opposed to the host, and it just opens the collaboration up. I think it's a brilliant idea, and I think that absolutely is what happened with me. It is all online. They have everybody's talk, interviews, whatever, on a Facebook page that anyone can go to and watch. Um, and it's 4C is in the number 4 and the letter C, and you can do a quick search on Facebook and you can find it. They have a video link, and you can just watch everybody. You know, if, you're, if you're so inclined, you can watch everybody's talk. You can watch interviews. You can watch – they have a tour of St. Petersburg. But it was just fascinating. And the most fascinating thing to me, aside from the conference, was I – got to I, I i'll use the word ingratiate i don't know if that's even the correct word in this case but i ingratiated myself um into a group of other speakers who were mostly from russia and a couple of belarusians um and of course a couple of people who were who are from saint petersburg and so i got to go out with them and see and, and, and go out and do just like normal mundane things shop go to a restaurant walk around downtown hit a hit up a bar um, drink which, vodka. Yeah, oh, they definitely wanted to drink <laughs> vodka. And uh, thank God for the potato spirits. Uh, they actually they don't use potato. They are all wheat. Um, and there we. Oh, uh, well, yeah, so yeah, one of the yeah, things that, that I did do touristy is I went to the Museum of Russian Vodka, and it actually exists. And um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I kid you not, it was pretty fascinating. Um, but they are, and, oh, and and part of the tour. No, I'm not kidding on this either. Our three shots of vodka, all different types. Just like, just like when you and I went to H.O. in Mexico and we did the the uh, the, the tequila thing, and we had to Absolutely. tell and we had to tell the restaurant owner, please do not give us full shots, or we will be crawling out of here. <laughs> they do not take that advice at the Museum of, of Russian Vodka. You get full shots, and you are it's part of the tour. You are expected to do them. 
you're expected to crawl out of there. Well, it's, I mean, it's, I mean, three shots to some people is like, holy crap, you know, three shots to someone like me is like, well, I'm not driving. And, you know, so <laughs> I guess it depends appetizer. on your point of view. <laughs> it's an appetizer. <laughs> right. It's an appetizer. Well, and this was like one in the afternoon also, which made it even, you know, it's like, well, if I'm at a sporting event, I probably am drinking beer. So, you know, salute. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, it's dessert. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but the mundane part of, of everything was the most fascinating thing to me. And, you know, there was one point where there's this woman on the street with her daughter who's probably, I'll say, four years old. They have a lot of crosswalks there with no signage or anything. And so you're just expected to know that when you come to the crosswalk, you look and you stop. So anyway, so she went over one of these crosswalks with her with her little daughter and got to the other side of the street and bent down and was obviously just mother-daughter teaching her, you know, all about, just like everybody does, about crossing the street and, you know, and what that means and, and you know, you can kind of just get the body language of, you know, that was a really good girl. And so, you know, and then they moved on. And there was just something about that. And, I, and this was really early in the trip that just made me look at everything very differently of, okay, so here are these people in Russia who obviously, you know, if you're our age, you've been indoctrinated your whole life, like evil, big, bad people, you know, or at least big, bad country. And then you, and you put your own prejudices and um, thoughts about what, what people are like or, or how their lives, you know, you don't necessarily think of any of these people as bad people, but, you know, what the government is feeding to them and spewing them is, sure, you know, and I'm just watching, you know, and, and so it just made me watch the rest of the time. And it's like the differences in who we are were so minimal. Nobody treated me badly because I was an American and I tried to blend in. I, I made sure that the wardrobe that I took was not going to be over the top American and but I'm sure that, in, you know, in some ways, there, I still stand out and maybe in ways I don't even know. Right. Everybody was super polite. I tried to speak uh, and I, I tried to learn a little bit of Russian before I went. I tried to speak when appropriate to other people and how much that would just light people up that I was trying, that I was not coming over there just like, well, I speak English and a lot of you have learned English, so you just speak English back to me. Um, and just how much things like that made a difference. I had been told by people who'd visited Russia before that, you know, they're dour and nobody smiles and the culture is very different. I did not, at least in St. Petersburg and at least where I was at, I did not find that to be true at all. Everybody was super polite. Um, and all I tried to do was just be the best ambassador that I could in my own small way, you know, for my country, my company, my whatever, just myself. And I was treated just really, really well, and it was just a great experience. And I and St. Petersburg is a lovely city. Um, it was both familiar and alien all at the same time, um, which is the best way I can describe it. It certainly is. There's no city like that in the United States. And while it has kind of a European look and feel, and, and that was purposeful because that's what Peter the Great wanted to do. He fell in love with Venice, and so he wanted to kind of recreate it. It's not. It's it's still very Russian, but it's just a really unique place. And the weather was unnaturally good. It was sunny every day we were there, which apparently is like not the norm. And it was just lovely. I, my talk went well, which is the whole point. I would absolutely do it again in a heartbeat. Well, you know, I think there is some universal things that exist amongst all people that we do tend to lose sight of, right? Because – it has to be the us versus them, and that's the way people rally. And instead, there's there's a universality. Mm -hmm. Is that the right word? I don't yeah, know, close enough. Like that. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're going with it now. Hey, look, I, I'm learning. I'm learning Spanish, and one of the things that I keep telling <laughs> I, that I keep telling Laurie all the time is, we all mangle our own language. Don't worry about it in the other language. They'll figure out what you're saying. Just get close. Absolutely. But there is that that universal desire that we all want that really binds us together more than 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 separates or differentiates us. Mm -hmm. So tell me more specifically about your talk while you were there. This this has to do more specifically with gaming, right? Yeah, of course, you know, with Wargaming being a game company, it was, you know, it was heavily focused on games. Um, there was a little bit of stuff that could be universal to other, to, to any discipline, you know, talks about leadership and team building and things like that. But it was still all with a heavy game focus. My talk was, it was called Sing It. And it's 
using the principles of music to direct voice talent, to get better, deeper reads out of people, um, and to give them, instead of vague terms like be happier or put a smile in your voice. Put a smile on that, would you? Yeah, Yeah. right. Um, Pick it up a scotch. Yeah, well, 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 that's at least that's at least somewhat concrete, you know. So, yeah, yeah. you know, um, that's giving you something you can do. I do think that if somebody's musical, speed it up about ten beats per minute um, makes a lot of sense. If you, you know, if somebody's not musical, and I probably wouldn't say that unless I really knew the person really understood music. And and a lot of voice actors, I mean, you're somebody. You, you I mean, you play music. You you play piano. You play guitar. You sing. Um, and, and I do find that a lot of actors do come from either they were musicians first or they are musicians also. Um, but even for somebody non-musical, if you just, if you just say, so I want you to speed that up about 5%, um, or you give them a thing. So you're going about this pace. I want you to go that pace. Um, it's, it's giving people more concrete things, but it's using music. It's using volume and pitch and melody and rhythm and tempo and arrangement to be able to give people very concrete things. Because if I tell you to be happy, your version of happy is probably slightly different than my version of happy. I know when you're happy. You know when I'm happy. uh, But we may express it in slightly different ways. And so if I just tell you be happy, well, that's good. Can you be a little happier? Well, maybe what you're doing is is that is your version of happy. And so all you're going to do is like you're going to do it times two, and it doesn't fix whatever the issue is. But if I tell you, raise your pitch a little bit, speed up, and project a little bit more, or I, you know, some combination of that, I'm telling you things that will make you sound happier, but I'm giving you, I'm not giving you something vague, and I'm not criticizing what you're doing. I'm giving you very specific things to tweak. And yeah, it's like if you were directing Nick Offerman. Okay, Nick, be a little happier. You're right. <laughs> uh, I'm happy. Right. No, happier than that. How about this? Right. Yeah, yeah, that, that was great. great. Right. No, it, it's, it's interesting because coming from the acting side, there's two schools of thought. One is inside out and the other is outside in. And what I mean by that is inside out means that you truly feel the emotion inside and that's what drives your performance, right? Because mm-hmm. you create all that emotion inside of yourself and then you let it come out. Mm-hmm. The other is outside in where you actually study and understand the physical attributes of what happens when you're sad, what happens when you're devastated, right. you know, and, and what are the differences between and then you take and you start to do those physical things mm-hmm. and then that creates the emotion, mm-hmm. right? You and I have been directing voice talent for, thank God, a couple of decades now mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> and I've always come This is you, all you know, your fault, more, Talbot. Right, right. I'm so sorry. Uh, although I'd like my royalty cut. Um, <laughs> I would too. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Okay, I'll back off of that one. Um, and I always come from it from the actor's side, which is really trying to create that inside out. And mm-hmm. and the sing it concept is really much more of an outside in to help people who may not be able to generate that inside out and well, as an actor some sometimes you do do inside out and sometimes you do outside in it's not that one is better than the other or one is right and one is wrong it's different for different situations well i think that i would tweak that slightly and say that i'm not trying to tell somebody how to get to the point i, mean, I guess i mean i guess i am but i'm not but but let's say that you're somebody who you can channel whatever the emotion or the you know, you know the thing is and you can um, and you can do what my friend Zach Hanks calls getting into flow. It's, it's that same thing that, you know, that I look at it from a, from a performance aspect where I'm on stage and I'm not thinking about what I'm playing. I'm not thinking about what's coming up. I'm just in that mode where I and the other and the, and the rest of the band are just in this groove where you turn, everything comes off. Your inner critic shuts down. You're, you don't think about what you're doing. Everything just seems to be working. Actors can get to that point too, and I think that would probably be very much an an inside out type of thing. But I can't yeah. I can't direct that. I can't tell you how to do that. What I right. can do is give you specific things to get to that. However, you're using that because I would I would say that if an actor really is in flow and there's just a slight adjustment that needs to be made probably for like one line or one read or something like that as opposed to like we're really trying to set the character 
they're not going to take that, especially if, if like we've gone 10 prompts and, you know, and everything's been great. Um, and then there's this one. By giving them something specific, it doesn't take them out of flow. They will accept this and they will just make that adjustment and then we just move on. Um, right. So it is an outside in sort of approach, but simply because I can't direct inside out. And maybe some people can. I don't know how you do that. I don't know how you can essentially get into that spot with somebody. I have seen a couple of things that were pretty darn interesting. There was a really and, – and it kind of, to me, stretched ethical boundaries, but everybody seemed to be on board with it, so I guess it was okay. If you go and you, you can watch somewhere, do a search for a – Bioshock 2, I think it was Bioshock 2 and not Bioshock 3. It's either Bioshock 2 or Bioshock 3. There is, uh, and they're filming the, the female lead actor. And the director is to get her into this spot. And I don't remember who the director is, is actually berating her. And in it's pushing the boundaries ethically, but she seemed to be on board with it. And it got her to this spot where she... I mean, the, what she did with, with that scene was pretty amazing, but it was really uncomfortable to watch. <laughs> and, it's well, so and, and it's interesting that you go there. I was in a film one time and um, it, it was a little, little dark. Okay, it was very dark. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> to be able to get the actress that, was, that I was playing against, there's this point where she has to be deathly afraid of me, mm -hmm. right? And so I'm on set all day and I'm joking and having fun between takes and all that. And I'm just, I'm Brian, the nice guy, right? Right. right. And, and, and then, and then when we start rolling, I become this incredibly dark and, and scary freaking character, mm -hmm. right? That is like, holy shit. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and part of that is that, yeah, personally for me, I have to be able to come out of that in between takes. Right. So that it doesn't just I, because it, it gets really dark really quick. Mm -hmm. Right. And so so we did the shots and then they did the individual takes. Mm -hmm. Right. So they shot me first doing my stuff. And, right. And I, and I did it. And then they shot her and they were trying to get her reaction. Mm -hmm. And her reaction was total fear and and totally breaking down and crying and just kind of hysterical. And so they did, they did one and it's like, yeah, it's okay. They did another one and yeah, it's okay. So I got up and I stood right behind the camera mm -hmm. and they started rolling. And then I just, I let her have it. I screamed and, and did my, my biggest, most frightening thing. And she just, she crumbled. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as they cut, I, I, I mean, right away you feel horrible right you have to go back and you go i'm so sorry it's, you know that's not me i just I, I was trying you know i was helping you and she's like no 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 that was great thank you but it's a very weird thing when you're going through it right, right. and it's it's that reaction and and that's the thing that i was i've always found really interesting about acting um i can't stand when actors leave when it's a cutaway and and, and they're not in it right mm -hmm. because you have to, acting is playing off of someone else right and that's when you always get your best shots, mm -hmm. right? If someone's staring at the camera and and needs to cry, mm -hmm. right? I'll stand behind the camera and I'll start to cry. And when they see me and see my eyes and see that I'm crying, then they'll cry, mm -hmm. right? And you still make that connection, even knowing you're not in it. I think that's some of the same kind of stuff that you're talking about. But again, that's creating that balance between the inside out and the outside in. Right. And how to kind of breach that. Well, and I find, especially with what I do, which is strictly voice acting and voice acting direction, of course, and not, you know, on camera, even those points where an actor is in flow, I don't really want my actors to be, you know, sad or angry or whatever. They, you know, I mean, if, if they can get to that point and, and it gets them to the prompt, but then they can pop back out, that's great. Because for starters, and you know this from doing voiceover and especially from doing video game voiceover, you may need to be angry for three prompts and then you're going to be jolly. You know, it's <laughs> – it, there's, there's no – you're not necessarily following a story arc. You won the game. Okay, next line. You lost you the game. You just right. exactly. lost the game. Because yeah. that's the way writers yeah. think. It's like, well, we have to fill right. these prompts. And, you know, and yeah, you could reorder the script and all that and really make your editors all wonky. But, you know, it's so – so they need to be able to get to that emotion 
Um, and so I think that it it is it becomes just based on that it becomes more technique driven. It becomes more I need to do the things that make me sound angry without being angry right now. Well, and I think I think you just hit on one of the key differences between a video game voice actor and an actor. Absolutely. Right. Because video games, not only do you have to be able to switch prompts very quickly, right, and switch moods and switch um, where you are, but you actually have to, it really helps anyway, to have a technical understanding of the game, how the game goes together, and and how your character fits into that all the way through, and, and be able to understand that the, the, the writer's right for a one line at a time situation where mm. this really does get down to the individual line by line. And that's why not all actors can be really effective at acting in video games. Right. Video games is really a kind of a unique segment that takes some different kinds of skills. Mm-hmm. Well, and there are so many things that are different between visual acting uh, versus just voiceover. Again, as, as you know. So one of the things that I do when I direct I, I'm trying to remember. I don't. I think you do this too. I don't watch the actor when they're cutting, and I encourage people to you know to use physical action because I think it it helps push their voice in the right way. There are two people that I think are good actors, bad voice actors, good on camera film actors. So sure. Peter Peter Dinklage and Toby Maguire both were cast in video games and they're both really fine actors but they use and, and they both have different techniques but you know that ability to you know in Toby Maguire's case he's a very understated actor and he uses facial expression as opposed to big grand eloquent moves he or uses anything. subtlety yeah he's subtlety very is, subtle is, is yeah the problem is is that when you strip away all the visual things that you've got to work with, all the things that inform the viewer what you're trying to convey, and it can only come out of your voice, that's a different skill. And there are not every actor can do that. So I don't want to also be swayed by something that they do visually that might make me go, that was an awesome take, only to come back and hear it later on and go, why did I mark that one? Because it's not there. So yes, yeah, su- subtlety can can be really hard to translate over audio only. Absolutely, when you lose your physical abilities to share your physicality that way. Absolutely. Um, but as an actor, especially for audio only for games, my God, is it physically exhausting? Because you are moving and jumping and 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 pounding and beating and fighting and and doing all the things that that your character is actually doing while they say the lines. That's another outside in to be able to get to that, right? Absolutely. Um, a lot of the stuff is a very physical um, activity. Mm-hmm. I've come out of voice sessions absolutely exhausted. Oh, I've, I've, <laughs> like, I hear, I hear but that. All from you a- do is talk. What do you, why? I don't get it. Oh, it's, no, I, hear, I yeah. hear that from actors all the time. And, and it's one of the reasons I, you know, I really try to give people breaks, especially if we're, and some of it is you, you want to give people breaks because, you know, maybe it's being stressful on their voice. Uh, but a lot of times it's just like, you know, and you can kind of hear it sometimes with actors where they are, they just, you can, you can just kind of hear that little bit of exhaustion and you have to give them the opportunity. It's like, Hey, let's take a break, go, go get some coffee, use the restroom, you know, just walk around, whatever. Um, sure. and almost give that mental reset. Cause it can become physically exhausting. It is. I mean, uh, you know, especially for any game that has some sort of combat in it, but even sometimes things that are just really emotional, it can be exhausting because you are trying to get yourself to, you know, these various emotional states, you know, or at least to sound like you're in those various emotional states. And even if you're doing, as I'm going to adopt your term, you know, outside in techniques, at some point, if you are acting upset, at some point that seeps into your body somewhere. You don't want it to seep in too much. Absolutely. But it does seep in somewhere. And that's an exhausting place to be. You know, if you're doing games like, Prey or Dishonored to use a couple of, you know, Austin based games or, you know, or World of Warcraft or, you know, or whatever. Yeah, there just there come points where it's like I need to I need to break from this. I did a dozen voices for a game called Observer, which is a really dark psychological thriller game. Uh-huh. It took me a long time to record that and 
even knowing I only had a, a you know, 20, 30, sometimes 50 or 60 lines per character. And that's still a um, lot, especially for that many characters. It is, right? And some of the characters were like five lines. Yeah, right? of course. But it took me a long time to do that because I knew the game and I knew how those characters fit in without seeing the whole script. You can kind of tell, mm-hmm, right? Sure. By the lines and the prompts and the situations and all that stuff. And it was just totally totally physically exhausting to do some of those really dark characters now the game's out and it it's a pretty cool game so you know that's kind of the reward right when the when the piece comes out and you're like wow wow that's pretty cool (laughs) yeah no it is i mean and well i you know it's the same thing with with film as well you know you i mean you do cut some things that are you know that are just you their reaction shots their soliloquies you know whatever they may be there still, I think, is is that, and, and you're more acquainted with this than I am, but I still think there's that magic, you know, of like seeing it put together. It's like, wow, well, that worked well. Or unfortunately, sometimes, wow, that stank. <laughs> but you hope, right, right. you hope that's not what, the, what you see. But yeah, definitely with video games, because you don't even do, there's so, you know, and I'm trying to do more ensemble stuff, you know, but that's just not the norm. Whether it should be or not is almost moot in a way. When you're doing your things, you the only setup you get sometimes is me, and I'm not an actor. I'm probably better than I used to be, but you know, but I'm not trying to be an actor. I'm just being a director. So I'm giving you setups, um, and I may be you know reading with you, but you know I'm not you know. And and one of the things I found for me too when I do stuff like that is I will sometimes go to different places than an actor would purposely. Because my whole job is to get you to a specific spot, right? I'm not trying to be the character I'm reading. I might do something like, this would be totally inappropriate for whatever the script is, but I might get in and I might go, you need to listen to me right now. You, do you understand me? Do you hear me? And I might get, you know, it's like something really dark like that. Um, right. Because they'll react to it differently. And then maybe the next time we go through it, it's like, I might shout that same thing. Um simply just to get a different reaction. Yeah, you're just trying to elicit the response that's Absolutely. appropriate. And that, and that is the role of the director, right? right? And that's how the director and the actor are very different. Other than Ron Howard, if you really liked Andy Griffith. Um, <laughs> well, he was a child there actor. Aren't a whole yeah, lot of, you can't really... Yeah. Well, yeah. okay, happy days. That, that's probably better. Than, <laughs> hey, now who didn't love Eat My Dust, right? <laughs> I mean... That... Ron Howard's classic, Eat My Dust. <laughs> Mostly directors are not actors. And so it is. It's it's being able to find that and bridge that. And the other thing that's really important about a director is a director really has the whole vision in their head about the technical side, the performance side, how it all blends together, how it has to mesh into right. um, the, the creative side of it and and the actual technical, um, how's, how's it all going to look when it's finished. And they have the vision. Right. So. Yeah, and that is a little bit different, uh, at least from my uh, perspective. Um, I try to get as much of the vision as I possibly can, but I have not, in most cases, I mean, there were a few, there have been a few exceptions uh, in my career, but in most cases, I have not had the opportunity to work on whatever for, you know, the length of time that other people put into it. So I'm coming in towards the end. Yes, I get a script. Yes, I usually have some time to look it over and absorb it. Um, a lot of the times because I'm, I'm usually also involved in the casting process. So I have the script, you know, maybe, you know, even a couple of weeks before we're going to cut it. But that's it. I'm, you know, I have not seen the vision and how we've gotten to this point. So I do have to rely and I'm pretty fierce about this, about having somebody, a, a stakeholder in session with me with the understanding um, and this I absolutely learned from you. I am the only voice to the actor, or if they are there, it's because they're weighing in on something, you know, technical as opposed to performance. Like, oh, no, no, this needs to be shouted because you're actually on a battlefield and everybody's 20 feet away. Oh, gotcha. We, you know, I maybe not have known that because it's not always evident from the prompt. Sure. So they're not to tell somebody how to act, they can tell me. You know, so if you voice it, voice it to me. Don't voice it to the actor. So part of my role, and I watched you go through one memorable thing that we probably won't recount here, where you were absolutely usurped. Uh, actually, I think you, you you squashed it, which was good. But 
you are the translator. <laughs> when you were talking to you when you were talking to the person from the company, you are speaking game, you're speaking producer, you know, whatever it may be. When you talk to the actor, you're you're talking actor. And how right. they describe something and how you converse with with the the writer or the producer or um, you know, whoever that is there is very different in most cases from how you speak to the actor. Right. So you're, so you're usually kind with the actor and for the, for the people on the game side, it's STFU. Yeah. <laughs> yeah they're, they're, it, 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 I mean, it can be absolutely. It's like, look, what did you hire me for? If you want to direct, you know, uh, I'll go find something else to do today. It's right. a nice day. There's a bar open. I'm good. <laughs> In Russia, there's always a bar open. <laughs> always a bar open. <laughs> oh, so, wow, we have rambled on a bit about voice acting and directing and, and, and all that, but it's 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 been a lot of fun. We should probably wrap this one up and uh, yeah, maybe pick it up uh, uh, again next time. I think that sounds awesome. Well, you know, this is not work. Uh, I always love talking to you about whatever. Absolutely. Randall? Brian. Thank you so much. Uh, I always appreciate it. It's such a pleasure. Thank you. Likewise. And we will reconvene. Same bat time, same bat same channel. Same bat channel. Excellent. Thanks, buddy. All right. Talk to you soon. Let's Talk VoiceOver is hosted by Randy Ryan, owner of Hamsterball Studios, voice music and sound design, and Brian Talbot, actor and all-around creative guy. If you have comments, questions, ideas for show topics you'd be interested in hearing, or you just want to let us know what you think, you can reach us by sending an email to bt at letstalkvoiceover.com or go to our website at www.letstalkvoiceover.com. That's letstalkvoiceover.com. Subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite media app so you don't miss an episode. And follow us on Facebook and Twitter, too. Thanks for listening to Let's Talk VoiceOver. We'll talk again real soon.